Hi, students, and welcome to today's live IELTS class. My name is Adrian, and I'm streaming to you live from beautiful Hungary here in the capital of Budapest. I hope everybody is having a great week so far. This is a members chat class, which means only channel members can chat. That's different from subscribers. It means you need to click the join button besides the subscribe button. And uh, if you're not a member, that's okay. Don't worry about it. You can watch this class and we do have an all chat class coming up in 90 minutes. In this class, we are looking at some questions and answers about the writing section and focusing especially on using correct punctuation in writing task one and two. Punctuation means period, comma, colon, semicolon, all of those little symbols. How do you use them appropriately so that you're getting marks and you're not losing marks? Hi, Preeti. This class, the materials are coming from our websites for academic IELTS. Check us out at AEHELP dot com and for the general version of the exam check us out at g i e l t s help dot com and of course you can download our academic i e l t s app look for our shield and search in your play store or apple store for academic i e l t s help hi zainab hi kisi hi hermes good to see more members joining in on the class now Members, a very special announcement. We are going to release new membership levels. This is a new feature on YouTube. There will be different levels of membership with different perks that will be coming in the next couple days. So keep an eye out for that. Exciting times. All right. If you have questions, or comments, concerns about our products or about the exam, just send me an email, adrian, A-D-R-I-A-N, at aehelp.com. Let's get into our lesson. So, uh, at the end of last week's class, we discussed a couple punctuation marks. What were those, members? Do you remember what we talked about in last week's class? What were the punctuation marks that I touched on and discussed with you? Alexander, H-O-L-S. Oh, I think you meant hola, as in hello in Spanish. Not a punctuation mark as far as I know. <laughs> Preeti says we discussed the comma. Absolutely. Yeah, the comma is the most tricky and important punctuation mark to use correctly in your task one and two. Um, Preeti, it's not called a point, it's called a period. Okay, as far as I know, we call it a period in all regions, although I could be wrong, it could be used maybe as a point in some other part of the world. Yeah, Preeti, uh, the period is also referred to as the full stop, absolutely. Yeah, the full stop. Okay, so, Again, remember, there are 14 different punctuation marks that are commonly used in the English language. Uh, make sure to know how to use them. It is very important. If you don't use them correctly in your task one and two essays, you will lose marks. So today, I want to talk about the semicolon and the colon to start, and we'll see how far uh, we go with those. Okay, so here we go. Let's talk about the semicolon. The semicolon is kind of this dot with this comma underneath. So it's like um, multiplying or dividing the period with the comma. Okay, now the semicolon is used to connect independent clauses. What is an independent clause? What's another way to say independent clause? Hi, Amarjeet. 
So I want to do this more of as a discussion with you members because I think that's much more effective for your learning. So what is an independent clause? It's very important that students are clear on the difference between dependent versus independent clauses. Uh, Hermes, non-related clauses is not actually the same. And you will see in this case especially, um, Kisi, that's a more accurate description. I know, Hermes, that sometimes teachers will say it's a non-related clause, but in fact, it's exactly the semicolon which is contrary to that belief, okay, which gives a contrary situation to that belief. Uh, Kisi, that's more accurate that a, an independent clause is a full sentence. It means it has a subject, a verb, and an object. Okay, it does not need a conjunction in the sentence, Preeti. Okay, unless we're talking about coordinating conjunctions. All right, so an independent clause is a full sentence. Okay, just remember it as a full sentence. Now, at times when you're writing, and this is actually very good writing technique, your independent clauses have actually close relationships to each other, or Hermes, we can say that they're actually related to each other. And that's when you need to use a semicolon. That is the best use of a semicolon. And you see the example here, John was hurt. Okay, so we have subject, verb, object. Okay, and then here we have, he knew she only said it to upset him. So this here is another independent clause, okay? It has the subject, it has the verb, okay? And it has the object. So these are two very related clauses. This is very strongly connected to this sentence, okay? This writing or this combination of two sentences using the semicolon here would be in a narrative piece of writing. So it'd be kind of like storytelling, okay? Um, so maybe before this sentence, we can imagine that the story reads such as John was having a terrible day. All of his friends were speaking negatively about him. John was hurt. He knew she only said it to upset him. Okay. So this clause here makes sense. This uh, independent clause makes sense because of the semicolon. So we know that this was a statement by one of the characters in the story. And the reason she made this statement was to make John angry. So one more time, John was hurt. He knew she only said it to upset him. In this case, the uh, semicolon is very important to clearly comprehend or understand this sentence. Okay. So Preeti is asking, means we can show two full sentences which are related to each other, and that time you use a semicolon. Yes. Now, the key here, students, okay, and it's very important to remember this, is that they have to be strongly related, like in this situation here. The most common mistake with the semicolon is that students or authors use it when the connection is weak or it's just neutral between the two independent clauses. It is not good to use the semicolon in that case. It's better to use either a period if the relationship is weak, so two separate sentences separated by a period, or if there's a neutral relationship, you might need to use a coordinating conjunction like comma or comma and, which makes that relationship clear for the reader, okay? So a very important point here is, a couple of important points, especially on the IELTS exam, is only use the semicolon 
when there is a strong relationship between the two independent clauses. Again, I'm going to emphasize this, the most common mistake made by authors is to use a semicolon when the relationship Oh, while I'm writing this, or while I'm giving you this note, members, uh, try to give me an example sentence using the semicolon. So any sentence works. Uh, maybe think about a task to question or just a sentence that comes to mind. Uh, and uh, write an example sentence. It is considered one sentence. So write an example sentence using the semicolon. Mastering the semicolon can help to increase your band scores, for sure. Okay, so Amarjeet, Hermes, Kisi, Preeti, I challenge you to give me a sentence using the semicolon, and I will let you know if it's used correctly or if you should have gone a different direction. Okay, and I'm going to finish this note here while you create those example sentences. So the most common mistake made by authors is to use a semicolon when the relationship is weak. Okay, so be very careful. In these cases, the author should either separate the sentences with a period or use a coordinating conjunction. Okay, so keep that in mind, all right? That's a very important point for the semicolon. All right, Hermes has an example up there. Uh, Hermes says, the Amazon jungle is burning. The Brazilian government can't stop it. Yeah, that'll work, Hermes. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's definitely a good, strong relationship between the Amazon jungle of Brazil and the Brazilian government's efforts to stop it from burning. That will work, okay? That will work. Now, Hermes, that is a general statement. It means it's happening now. Keep that in mind. Okay, Yvonne, good to see you in class. I didn't catch you earlier, but you caught me, which is great. Um, Yvonne says, I played games all day. I had a whole day off work. Um, Yvonne, uh, that's okay. However, um, there I might opt to use a coordinating conjunction instead because there's a very strong cause and effect relationship. So I would write that, Yvonne, as um, I had a whole day off work, comma, so I played games all day. But it's not bad, Yvonne. It is acceptable, okay? Uh, a stronger relationship, Yvonne, so the relationship is conceptual, and it is up to the author to decide the strength of the relationship. I might write something, Yvonne, with the semicolon like, I played games all day, semicolon, uh, I won some, I lost some, okay? All right, uh, Amarjeet says, IELTS is mandatory, I want to go to Canada for further study. Amarjeet, the relationship is not clear there, okay? Um, you need to have a stronger relationship. I want to go to Canada for further study. It's not clear for the reader how that connects to uh, IELTS being mandatory. So Amarjeet, um, for the reader, try to think about the reader. And I think that's another good note to put here. When you read your sentence, as you use the semicolon, think about the reader's position. Um, deeply consider the audience position when they read your sentence which uses the semicolon. OK. 
Okay. So if I'm the audience, Amarjeet, and I read that sentence, I'm not sure what you're trying to tell me. And if I'm not sure about it, that means that the semicolon is not used correctly. Okay. Um, Amarjeet, a better sentence would be like, um, I E L T S is mandatory semicolon. I must take it for immigration. Okay. That would make the sentence connection much clearer for your reader. Okay. Or even I E L T S is mandatory semicolon, um, governments demand English skills. Okay. As long as we know what IELTS is, of course. All right. Uh, Preeti says, my friend had an accident. Don't forget your uh, particle, Preeti. So my friend had an accident, no space, Preeti. The semicolon should come right after the T. Remember what I said. That's a mistake on the exam if you have a space between the uh, last letter and the semicolon. So semicolon, comma, period, colon, they do not have a space uh, before them. Okay, remember that, Preeti, otherwise it's a mistake. So my friend had an accident, semicolon, space, her right leg is fractured. Okay, um, was fractured. Yeah, was is okay as long as the timeline matches. That's good. Otherwise, Preeti, except for that space, uh, the example is good. My friend had an accident, her right leg was fractured. That's a good use of the semicolon because the relationship is very clear. Okay. Um, Kisi says, I took online English classes, semicolon. It could improve my language skills. Yes. Uh, one small correction, Kisi. So the semicolon is used well. Just be careful with your pronoun, Kisi. Classes is plural. So instead of it, you should be using they could improve my English language skills or my language skills. Okay. So just your preposition or sorry, your pronoun Kesey. careful with your pronoun. Okay. Uh, Chantal says IELTS is one of the admission requirements in Finland. So I have to take the exam. Um, Chantal, good use of the semicolon, but bad use of the word. So, when you have the semicolon, the semicolon is able to replace the coordinating conjunction. Don't use them together, Chantal. So either use a comma with the coordinating conjunction or just use the semicolon, but not both. Okay. So uh, that's another point to consider with these semicolons. Okay. Uh, semicolons usually... I say usually because there are exceptions and I won't go into those right now. Um, semicolons usually are not followed by conjunctions when used well to join two related independent clauses. Okay. So do not use uh, fanboys. Okay. Which means for and nor so and so on. Okay. So don't use those. All right. So otherwise, if you take that out, Chantel, it's fine. All right. Joanne, good to see you in class. Joanne says I cooked for, I cook, sorry, one more time, Joanne. I cook for my family every day. Rice and beans are their preference. Joanne, that is a wonderful use of the semicolon. That is exactly how you use the semicolon correctly. Um, if I had to say, I don't like to compare students, but I would say that is the best use that I've seen so far of the semicolon. Okay. So it's a very good use of the semicolon. All right. So that is the primary use of the semicolon. Now let's talk. Oh, I have all this writing up here. You probably had a bit of trouble seeing what I was typing underneath. Uh, anyhow, um, let's take a look at the colon, okay, which is a very, very close relative or friend of the semicolon, okay? 
So the colon has three main uses, all right? Um, the first is after a word introducing a quotation or an explanation or an example. Now, the colon is kind of redundant, and I don't recommend using it in the IELTS exam. So I'm going to add this note here before we go over it, okay? Students, you do not need to use a range of punctuation marks in your exam to get a high band score. You can get a band 7, 8, or even 9 without using semicolons and colons, okay? If you really want to be a little bit on the fancy side, maybe use a colon or two in your writing. But I don't really recommend using the colon too much. Task one, academic, perhaps. Okay, perhaps in the task one of the academic, you can use the colon. But generally speaking, you should stay away from it because it's a bit redundant and you can make mistakes with it. Okay, so the colon is more dangerous than valuable for you in the IELTS exam. Okay, so um, you do not need to use, in university, college, yes, you will use it in your writing, but on the IELTS, it's not so important. So you do not need to use the colon on the IELTS exam. Okay, and that said, perhaps you may use it once in task one of the academic module, okay? All right, and I'll show you where in a second where you might use it in task one, but otherwise it's redundant. In most cases, just remember this, in most cases, either the semicolon or the comma can replace the colon, okay? So keep that in mind. All right, so here is our first example of using the colon. The colon here is used to introduce a list of nouns, okay? So read with me. He was planning to study four subjects Politics, philosophy, sociology, and economics. Now, in this case, you could replace the colon with a comma. Okay? So you could say he was planning to study four subjects. Politics, philosophy, sociology, and economics. All right? You can do it like that. You do not need to have the colon there. Okay? The second is between independent clauses when the second explains the first. And even here in the instructions, now this is not my original instructions. This is borrowed um, from an online source. So here it also tells you exactly what I'm saying. So it's similar to a semicolon, okay? So in these cases, you can usually use a semicolon instead of a colon. When you use a lot of different punctuation marks in your writing task one and two, it can become more confusing for your reader. So be really careful, okay? Here we go. I didn't have time to get changed. I was already late. Again, we could have just used a semicolon there. So I could just say, I didn't have time to get changed. I was already late. And yeah, it's an explanation. Um, which word is the punctuation mark replacing? Yes, Yvonne, you can. So Yvonne, that you're um, taking another example of what I'm showing you with this here, where you can basically replace punctuation marks with words, right? And Hermes says that it replaces the word because. Yeah, yeah. So I didn't have time to get changed because I was already late. Exactly, so rather than using the word because, 
I'm using this uh, colon here or the semicolon. Now, when would I want to do that? What do you think, students? So when would I choose as the author to use the semicolon or the colon instead of using because? So when might I do that? When might I start replacing the word because with a colon or a semicolon? So instead of using a subordinating conjunction of cause and effect, I'm using a punctuation mark. Why might I do that as the author? Very clever, Yvonne. And that is the correct answer. Absolutely. To not repeat words. Okay. So if I have a piece of writing where I'm showing a lot of cause and effect, perhaps the sentence before this one and the sentence before it, I'm already using the word because for other cause and effect relationships. To avoid word repetition or redundancy, I might say, oh, okay, I've already used because in this sentence up here. Just imagine that. So now I'm going to make it a little bit more fluent and interesting for the reader by using a semicolon. Okay, so here we're definitely getting into that much more technical band eight, band nine level writing. Okay, and yes, your examiners do recognize that. Okay, they know these punctuation marks and they do recognize when a student is controlling these elements in their writing. All right, okay, so this is the most important here. All right, the third reason, and I'm going to put a couple of asterisks here. So, the third use of a colon is for emphasis. Now, this is not actually mutually exclusive from the last two points. What do I mean by that? What I mean is that the reason we're using this colon here is actually for emphasis. Okay? So, I didn't have time to get changed. I was already late. So here, I'm emphasizing the fact that I didn't have time to get changed. Is everybody clear on the word emphasis? Emphasis is very, very important in the exam and in communication. Does everybody know what the word emphasis means before I go down this rabbit hole further? It's very, very important, okay? And I'll even make a little note here using parentheses that controlling emphasis in your writing and speaking is often the key to getting those really high band scores in the exam, like band 8.59, okay? So remember this, controlling emphasis precisely in your writing and speaking is often the key to band scores 8.5 and 9. 8.5 band and 9 band score is what ESL teachers, English as second language teachers, need to achieve to get jobs in many uh, English language institutions. Okay? Um, Preeti, yes, you're right. Emphasis means the level of importance, the significance, yeah. So it is the importance or the level of importance. Okay. All right. And you can control emphasis with punctuation marks. You can also control emphasis with what? What else? With words. And what else can you control emphasis with in your writing? Okay, so I know we're taking a little bit of a detour here, but it's a very important detour. Okay, so keep in mind that you can control emphasis with punctuation, words, so the choice of words or conjunctions, as I said before, correlative conjunctions. And what else? What else can you control emphasis with in your speaking and writing? 
These are the three elements, the, these two and the one missing, to control your emphasis in speech and writing. Master these and you will master communication. Okay, once you reach that upper intermediate level. Um, Hermes, stress is okay, yes. Um, I'll put stress there. I wasn't actually thinking about that, but yes, you can in verbal communication. The reason I wasn't thinking about that, Hermes, because in written communication, the stress is controlled by punctuation. But of course, when we speak, we can enunciate, draw out the words. So yes, the stress is one way. In writing, that's not as apparent. You do that with punctuation, like an exclamation mark, right? So what is the third way where you control emphasis in both speaking and writing? There is one more. Okay, maybe I'll give you a hint. Oop, not I want. That should be an E. There we go. I went to Paris versus I have been to Paris. How did I control? I'm not using different punctuation. Yes, some different words, but the words aren't the key here. What is the key to controlling my emphasis for the audience in my example here? I went to Paris versus I have been to Paris. Kesey says tense. Yes, it's very specific, Kesey, but there is an even more general term that we can use here which controls emphasis. Intonation, again, uh, Chantal, is marked by punctuation. So punctuation influences intonation, right? Um, it's simpler than that, students. It's a bit simpler than that. You were close, Kesey. You had a part of the answer, the bigger answer. The answer is grammar. Okay. So grammar helps to control emphasis. So the three ways that we can control emphasis in our communication is punctuation, words, and grammar. Okay, those are the three. The more you master those, the better you will perform on the IELTS exam in the speaking and in the writing. And the better you will perform in life. Controlling those three elements can make the difference between winning a $2 million business contract or losing it. Okay, it can have a very big factor in the process. All right. Uh, here's an example of using the colon for uh, emphasis. There was one thing she loved more than any other, her dog. Okay. So why does the colon create emphasis? Can you answer that question for me? I'll read it one more time. Tell me why the colon creates emphasis. There was one thing she loved more than any other, her dog. What creates the emphasis? And while you're thinking about that, I also challenge you to write a sentence where you create emphasis using the colon. This is the best case scenario uh, for you to think of if you're planning to use the colon in your IELTS exam. So write some example sentences for me um, while you're thinking of my previous question as well. It's not the more than any other, Preeti. That's not really it. So... The half break, okay, or the half stop. Creates emphasis for the reader by creating anticipation. OK, 
Okay, so remember that a colon is a half stop. Okay, the period is the full stop, the comma is the third stop. Okay, one third stop. So the colon creates the emphasis by creating anticipation. So if I'm reading this story to you, then in your mind, that half a second is enough for you to think, oh, what? what is it that she loves? What is it that she loves? So that question of what is it that she loves more than any other is born from this half second, half stop, right? There was one thing she loved more than any other, her dog, all right? It's that anticipation that creates the emphasis. Is that clear? Hopefully, okay. Um, please uh, write an example sentence where you're using the colon for emphasis, okay? And then I'll give you some feedback, of course, uh, whether or not you're using it correctly. Ivan says, I like different styles of music, jazz, rock, and classical. Ivan, classical, okay? C-A-L on the end of that word. Um, that is you're creating a list. So that's one mm, situation where I probably wouldn't use the uh, colon in my writing too much, okay? I would prefer to see commas there. Um, Yvonne, I'll show you where you can use it like that in task one academic in just a moment, okay? But instead, Yvonne, write a sentence where you're using the colon for emphasis, when you're trying to emphasize, emphasize a piece of information within a sentence. But it is a correct use, Yvonne. You did use it correctly there. I want to say that. Hermes says, my friends were in the, my friends were on the highest mountain around the world, Mount Everest. Um, yes, okay. Um, maybe it's good, Hermes. I would probably write it as my friends climbed the highest mountain in the world, Mount Everest. That is a good use of it, Hermes. So my friends climbed the highest mountain in the world, Mount Everest, okay? It reads better with that vocabulary, but the example is good, Hermes. All right, careful with your word choice, students. All right, Chantal says, my car has been broken for a week now, said Peter. Um, yes, uh, Chantal, so you're emphasizing um, what had been said. Um, Chantal, uh, again, careful with the word choice. So, um, we wouldn't say my car has been broken. Uh, my car had broken down for a week now, said Peter. Or my car has been broken down for a week now. A car breaks down, Chantal, so you need the word down. It reads awkward if you say just broken. Okay. I think, Chantal, the more natural way uh, that a person would express that is uh, my car has been in need of repair for a week now, said Peter. That would be the most natural way. So I'll just, uh, I'll write that here while we wait for some other answers. So my car has been in need of repair for a week now. Said Peter. Okay, that would be the better way uh, to write that. All right. Uh, Joanne says, I visited an interesting place with my friends last week. Disney World. Yeah, very good. Okay, so Joanne, again, that's a really good sentence. 
Um, the reason why that sentence is exceptionally good is because we don't have an idea of the interesting place. So the difference between uh, Joanne's and Hermes' um, example is that in your case, Hermes, um, with the highest mountain in the world, your readers would usually, most of them, would immediately think of Mount Everest. So it works, but the readers guess Mount Everest and guess it accurately. With Joanne's example, we have no idea. So with Joanne, she's saying, I visited an interesting place with my friends last week. That could be any place, okay? So it's suspenseful. And then Disney World, there's the emphasis, okay, with that break. Um, again, if you look at the example provided, it has that same level of suspense, okay? So there was one thing she loved more than any other. At this point, it could be anything, okay? But then we discover it's her dog. So to emphasize, build that suspense, build that unknowing suspense, okay? That's a good notion to keep in mind when you're doing this, all right? Uh, Preeti says there are two important services governments should improve immediately, health services and educational curriculum. Yeah, uh, Preeti, good, okay? Instead of approaches, the word curriculum is a better choice. The sentence otherwise, conceptually, Preeti, your sentence works well. Okay, Kesey says there was a big black and wired object in front of me. A birthday surprise. <laughs> okay, uh, Kesey, that's good. That works. Okay, um, I think maybe you meant to say white object, wired object. I'm not sure what it is, but the sentence works well. Okay. All right, so um, that's it for the colon and the semicolon for now. Uh, any questions, students, about the colon or the semicolon? And I see that several of you are experimenting with a combination of punctuation marks, which is great. Uh, that's what high-level writing often includes, so that's fantastic. Um, any questions about quotation, or sorry, um, colons and semicolons. Any questions about colon or semicolon? I want to cover one more important punctuation mark. Oh yeah, I mentioned to you, uh, some of you might be thinking, but you said you'd tell us how to use the colon in task one. So in task one, uh, you can use the colon. It's a technical piece of expository writing. Expository technical writing is where we see colons used for lists. Okay, so um, I'll explain that real quick here. So colons are often seen in technical uh, expository writing. Uh, such as explaining graphs and business communication. Okay, so in your task one, let's say that you're dealing with a pie chart, for example, um, the legend shows four uh, different types of pizza uh, which are represented by the pie chart, by the given pie chart. Uh, Hawaiian, pepperoni, um, meat lovers, and vegetarian, okay? So that would be an example of where you could use the colon. So Yvonne, uh, if you're doing the academic um, uh, version of the test, 
um, then, uh, or Ivan, sorry, I'm not sure how you pronounce that, Ivan or Ivan, um, then here is where you can use the colon, okay, in expository writing. So the legend shows four different types of pizza, which are represented by the given pie chart, Hawaiian, pepperoni, meat lovers, and vegetarian. That's where you can use it well, okay? Any questions, members, now for the colon and the semicolon? Okay, any questions? No? Okay, we'll go on. If questions do come to mind, students, again, remember, you can always send me an email, right? If you're like, oh, but there was this one place where I saw a colon and it was just used so differently, what is that? Um, because there are some more places that I didn't get into with some... Um, styles of uh, academic writing like uh, MLA and APA, but that's very technical and it's not really important. So you might see those in university or college. Um, all right, so let's talk about the dash and the hyphen. Okay, so the dash and the hyphen. These are two common punctuation marks, the dash and the hyphen, and they're often confused with each other. So people are like, when do I use one? and not the other, um, because they're really similar, but just a small, small difference between them, okay? Uh, so let's talk about them. A dash is used to separate words into statements. Um, there are two common types of dashes, N dash and M dash, okay? An N dash is twice as long as a hyphen, okay? So that's the most common one. So an N dash is long in your writing and if you use computers um, there is a different um, key for these and then the hyphen is a short one like that. So this one the N dash is twice as long as the hyphen. Okay. Um, the uh, N dash is a symbol represented like this dash basically hyphen hyphen. Okay. Um, it's used in printing to indicate a range or a connection of differentiations such as 1880 to 1945. So this is where we use it in a range, okay? Or Princeton, New York trains, okay? Meaning that Princeton and New York are two in the same in this case, all right? These days, because of a lot of new words and combination words uh, coming into the English language, uh, you see this use of the N dash quite often, okay? So Princeton, New York trains, all right? Um, I'll give you an example. Can, can you think, members, of examples of words or combination words where you see this type of use of the uh, dash. Let's see if you can come up with some. Okay. Um, you see them in these kinds of situations in writing. Well trained dog. Okay. So here, well trained, I'm using this N dash to um, connect uh, the words well and trained, and by doing that, I'm forming a single adjective for the noun dog, okay? Um, yeah, Chantal, that's a good one, okay? That's a double use of it, absolutely. Brother-in-law, sister-in-law, so in all of those cases, we use it. Uh, not using it here, so if you just say well no dash here, just well-trained dog, it's a mistake, okay? And that is counted as a mistake in the IELTS exam. So if you write well-trained dog without the dash, it is a mistake in your IELTS writing, okay? So again, punctuation marks do matter, okay? Keep that in mind. Um, make sure to practice those. One way to think about it is, are these two adjectives? So 
right now, a good question that some members might be thinking and some of our viewers is, how do I know when to use and when not to use that little hyphen? Okay, so how do I know that, all right? The way you can think about it is, what if I take it out? Okay, so think about these what ifs. So what if I just take it out? Okay, now I have well dog and trained dog. Does that make sense? No, it doesn't. Okay, so well trained dog only makes sense. This adjective only really makes sense when these two words are connected to each other. If I just go well dog, trained dog, it doesn't make sense. Okay, um, Kesey, yes, that works. Just make sure that there's a noun coming after that. So if you say he is good looking, then um, you might not need that hyphen. Okay, but if you say the good looking man, then you'll need it. Okay, but you're right, Kesey, that is a good example. So good looking, okay. So again, just think about it as, do, do these words make sense individually in the sentence? If not, then you need that dash, okay? All right, the M dash is longer than the N dash. The M dash can be used in place of a comma, parentheses, or a colon to enhance readability or emphasize the conclusion of a sentence. This is quite interesting, and this is kind of similar to um, considering the use of the colon, okay? Notice how, again, we have another replacement for colon. Uh, Part-time preti is very good. Old-fashioned is a very good example as well, okay, for the previous, absolutely, okay? All right, so, um, here we have this sentence. Uh, for example, she gave him her answer. No. So here, perhaps uh, there is a groom, hopeful groom, I guess we could say, who was hoping uh, to uh, get a yes answer when proposing to a woman, asking for marriage. And surprise, surprise, she gave him her answer. No. Okay. So in this case, we're using the M dash. Okay. Now, if you want to remember these, like you got, okay, Adrian, do I need to remember the names of these? Um, it's easy. Just think about it. Here you have three lines. Okay. In the N dash, you have two conceptually. All right. Uh, in handwriting, we just write them as longer lines. Okay. In typing, you type them as double, triple um, hyphens. Uh, but again, oftentimes, the uh, word processor will create the appropriate um, dash for you. So here, we use the three lines. It creates a long pause, again, suspense, no. And the easy way to remember them is the M is a double N, okay? So think about it like two Ns. So the N dash is double, the M is triple. So the M here is twice that N. So it's an extra hyphen. Does that make sense? Does that help you to remember the difference between N dash versus M dash? They sound so similar and they're often confused in writing for sure. So N versus M dash, is that clear? M, one more. One more, okay? So just keep that in mind. It's a little bit of a mnemonic help um, to keep that in mind, okay? All right, uh, now, um, here's an interesting um, replacement. One of the most common ways that you will see the M dash is to replace a comma, okay? Very common. Not very, but common, okay? Why? When do you think the author uh, 
Uh, Yvonne, very good question. Okay, I'll explain that in a second. Um, so before before I explain that, Yvonne, um, let's uh, let's discuss my question first here. So why do we use the m dash to replace the comma? What do you think? And I'll show you an example, I think. Here, I'll give you an example. I don't see one here, but I'll give you an example. So, the man who had been hired to do the job disappeared in the black woods last Monday. Okay, so there's an example of using that M dash in place of commas. The man who had been hired to do the job disappeared in the black woods last Monday. So here I'm not using the comma but I'm using the M dash. Why do you think that is? Why am I choosing an M dash here instead of commas? Yeah, Hermes, to give non-essential information, so it's an additive clause, but it's relevant to what I'm saying. That's one of the most common places to see it. And I might choose to do this, especially if I'm using a lot of commas, okay? So if I'm using a lot of commas in my writing and I want to create this kind of additive clause, okay, or definitive clause, then I can choose to use the M dash. That's one of the most common ways um, where I might opt for the M dash, okay? Um, Yvonne, very good. Okay, so Yvonne is asking an important question and I'm running out of time, so I don't want to rush. Um, use no spaces for the N dash when creating one word from two, but have a space before and after the M dash when using it to replace a comma, colon, or parentheses. Parentheses are brackets like this. Okay. So that's your answer, Yvonne, and that was a good question because using correct spacing in writing is very important, okay? So no spaces for the end dash when you make one word. So when we created the word like part-time, there's no space before or after. And when you're using the M dash like this, there's a space before and there's a space after. So keep that in mind, okay? All right, uh, members, that's all the time I have for today. I'll do kind of a fun exercise for an upcoming members class with these punctuations. I'll present you with an essay that's missing punctuation marks. And from these lessons, I'll challenge you to figure out what kind of punctuation marks go where in the essay. I'll leave it up to you. So that'll be a fun challenge for you. I'll figure out how and when to do that. So anticipate that uh, coming up in the next week or so. Uh, again, for everybody who's watching, I know that this was quite a specific topic for the IELTS task one and two. Nevertheless, punctuation is very, very important, especially learning how to use commas and periods appropriately in your task one and task two. In just 30 minutes, I will be continuing with a more targeted IELTS listening section, lesson with audio questions, practice, and strategies. Hopefully, I will see all of you there. That's it for now. Again, make sure to check us out on our websites, aehelp.com and G-I-E-L-T-S. 
www.thrivehealth.com where we have lots and lots of great material for you to really improve your band scores. That's it for now. See you in half an hour. Bye.